Cry It Out Loud, a podcast by Chasing the Rainbows, with your host, Bernice Quisenberry. On this week's podcast episode, we are doing our Ask a Maternal Fetal Medicine segment, and it's with Dr. Serena Wu, who is a maternal fetal medicine specialist who experienced her own baby loss. We appreciate you hosting this segment alongside us to help our listeners and all baby loss survivors get answers around our losses. So welcome back, Serena. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for having me again. It's been a little while, um, but I think we had a, a lot of things happen in between. Um, I got sick with uh, the flu. <laughs> Yes. Us too. Yep. Oh, it just hit. Oh, goodness. Yeah, it was pretty bad this year, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. No. And, and we appreciate you taking this time. And, and like you said, you know, we had a lot of things in between. And of course, you being a maternal fetal medicine doctor, all of us can understand, you know, what that entails and, and all that. So we just appreciate you doing this. So thank oh, you. Well, yeah. No worries. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead with our little disclaimer that we have here that we're not giving out any medical advice, medically treating any persons, medically diagnosing any persons or providing second opinions, virtual consults all throughout our entire podcast. For medical advice, treatment or diagnoses, please consult your primary care phys physician or obstetrician. This segment is just to give some peace for our listeners who are struggling with questions that are around their loss, but we are not opening and I'm um, sorry, sorry. But we are opening the ability to have a dialogue without feeling judged or silenced around our losses. So our intention is solely to help survivors process their traumatic losses. Mm -hmm. So in our last maternal fetal medicine, gosh, if I can talk today, that would be great. In our last uh, maternal fetal medicine doctor segment, we discussed 18 things that physicians and patients should question that was written by the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. And we hit about four of those 18 points. And from that episode, we actually got a bunch of questions to address, um, some follow-up questions from listeners, which is great because we want this to be interactive. We want you survive, fellow survivors out there, anybody listening, to feel comfortable writing in and asking us, you know, questions that you may have or, um, you know, around your losses, not just that, but around different materials and giving us topics to talk about. Um, since we have Dr. Serena here, who is so graciously, you know, willing to give us her time, um, you know, let's, let's ask her. So with that said, um, we're going to dive right into our questions. If that sounds good to you, Serena. Yeah, no, that I, I think um, before moving on uh, yeah. with the rest of uh, the rest of the 18 items, um, I thought it would be important to address the, the questions that were written in and, and um to just chat about uh, the the thoughts and the recommendations from um, the American College of OBGYN as well as the Society of MFM, um, a lot of this is, can be very confusing, um, and I would like to just put out there that um, in general, there there are guidelines or there are recommendations or what is recommended. Your particular provider, um, whether it's your OBGYN or your maternal fetal medicine uh, specialist, may do something a little bit differently. That in and of itself does not mean it's wrong. It's just the fact that there are many ways to get from point A to point B. Um, from point A when you get pregnant to having a healthy um term baby point B. So that being said, you know, what I or what uh, Bernice and I talk about today is generally what is accepted and, and what is what is out there if you were to do your own Google search or if your doctor talks to you. Um, so I, I mentioned that because I know that your doctor might tell you something just a little tad bit different um, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong. Um, and, and that just, I think, um, Bernice, uh, with your um, discussions with um, in your other podcasts and, and also talking with me is that um, what what really is important is opening up a dialogue with your doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really is. And it's 
it's feeling comfortable asking questions. And it's really about like educating ourselves to advocate for ourselves. And it's just, you know, for me, especially um, pregnancy after loss, um, I went in and, and I had a, like a laundry list of questions and it was to give me peace of mind. But I felt confident doing that with knowing more than I knew prior and things like that. So I think you're so spot on certain. Well, and it really is so individualized because everybody's different. Everyone's birth story is different. Everyone's journey is different. And that speaks to this as well. So this just, like you said, you know, Serena, it gives us almost that confidence to feel like, okay, I can go in and, and talk about this or ask them like, this is okay to ask because, you know, sometimes I, I feel like, am I being hormonal asking these questions or am I too over the top? But realistically, you know, like uh, for me to know, I have to ask if that makes any sense. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, so our next couple um, episodes with Dr. Serena will be um, going through the rest of that article, just other questions to kind of open that dialogue and things like that. Um, but yeah, from the first segment, we did, we got a, a couple questions. So um, that's great because listeners are, you know, getting something out of it and and just grateful that you're tuning in to us. So um the first one, it's interesting. So it says, has there been any findings of vaginal pro, um, progesterone leading to preterm labor? And can you shed light on vaginal progesterone in general and how it works? So this is a perfect question for me. I can't completely answer that question um, because in the sense of the fact that uh, no, there really isn't any data of vaginal progesterone leading to preterm birth. The circumstances surrounding why your doctor prescribed vaginal progesterone, there must have been something there, um, meaning right now the current recommendation for um, prescribing vaginal progesterone is if you've had a short cervix. Um, and possibly if in the setting of um, a prior preterm birth. So if your doctor prescribed you vaginal progesterone, my guess, because it's a guess, I, I, that's all that question stated, was that he, must, he or she must have seen a short cervix. Now, that being said, I could be wrong, obviously. There might have been other factors there that I'm not aware of that is the reason why uh, your provider prescribed the uh, vaginal progesterone. Um, if it was in the setting of you are having contractions and, and they were worried about preterm labor, typically we do not um, recommend vaginal progesterone in prevention of preterm birth or preterm labor. That is not the general recommended management for preterm labor. So if that was the reason for the um, recommendation or the starting initiation of vaginal progesterone, then I would say that is not the typical management. But if they prescribed it for you, it must have been in the setting of a prior preterm birth. Maybe you had a short cervix, but those would be typically the, the general reasons for starting that. Vaginal progesterone, I mean, progesterone is needed in, uh, in pregnancy to help, um, uh, help, uh, help keep you pregnant, basically. And declining um, levels of progesterone leads to uh, preterm birth and, or I mean, delivery and uh, leads to birth in and of itself. The precise mechanism of the action of progesterone to prevent preterm birth is actually not really well known. Um, it's, there's many pathways um, one of which is inflammatory that are proposed mechanisms for preterm birth. Um, it's a, if I could show you a slide of all the mechanisms that people have uh, proposed for uh, pathways leading to why a woman would go into preterm labor and end up with a, 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 pre, a premature baby. Um, there are many. Um, so we actually don't know for sure. They're all, they're all, um, um, they're all, uh, accepted or, or thought of mechanisms of why progesterone helps, um, but uh, there's nothing specific. Um, so 
it definitely has been identified to help with the uterine and cervical um, remodeling. And so vaginal progesterone is actually something used locally. It is a, uh, the progesterone is inserted into the vagina right next to the cervix. So that would, uh, it has been shown to help decrease the, the incidence of preterm birth and uh, preterm labor. So that's why it's, it's done. Um, and interestingly, I think up until just recently, last year, the um, injection of progesterone was um, widely prescribed and recommended. Since then, it's been taken off the market. Um, the FDA has removed its um, application for the prevention of preterm birth because studies, more recent studies have shown that it has no uh, decrease in preterm birth as opposed to getting a placebo. So someone who was receiving a shot didn't know whether they were receiving progesterone or not. Either way, both groups, one receiving progesterone, one receiving like saline, it didn't, it didn't affect the, the difference, uh, the frequency of preterm birth in either group. So that's the reason why it's been withdrawn as that. So vaginal progesterone is actually really the only um, medication now being used um, for the prevention of preterm birth in the setting of trying, uh, in the setting of prevention. Okay. That's good to know. And, you know, we were on progesterone shots after losing Brooke with our um, pregnancy after loss. And um, just because of it being an early term and they weren't necessarily sure exactly what caused it, all of those things, and it was preventative, but right. And um, now they don't recommend or, you know, the, the shots or anything like that now. And it's off, like you said, Serena. So that's, it's really interesting to see how in two years things change, you right. know? Right, so, right. Yeah. Thank you so much for shedding light on that. Um, so what is exactly the purpose of baby aspirin and starting it after the first trimester? So baby aspirin has been shown to decrease in high-risk women um, the, uh, the, um, um, the, the development of preeclampsia. And I think uh, uh, what preeclampsia is, we, we had touched upon that before, but pre preeclampsia yeah. is only something that occurs in pregnant women, can't occur in non-pregnant women. Um, because it, uh, it has to do, uh, and we believe um, they're still searching for the cause of preeclampsia. The person who figures that out will win the Nobel Prize for that. Um, but right. the preeclampsia is high blood pressure in pregnancy and protein in, in the urine. Um, and, and there could be other uh, things that we see to... Um, to give a person a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Um, but it is one of the things that leads to preterm birth because once you have uh, high blood pressure, that's what we call severe range, depending on where you are in your pregnancy, you may need to deliver. If you develop um, complications or, or uh, severe preeclampsia, that includes uh, things that uh, affect your liver, affect um, your brain, affect your kidneys. These are things that would get us to get you delivered. And, and the reason for that is that um, it doesn't go away unless you get delivered. So we can't, there's no medication we can give that will make the preeclampsia go away. Um, the only way to, uh, to manage it, uh, to make it go away is to deliver. We can only mitigate and, and keep you, keep you pregnant if need be, depending on if you're super early in your pregnancy. Um, if you get it after 34 weeks, depending on if it's severe or not, you may get have the recommendation from your doctor to be delivered. And so the purpose of aspirin, baby aspirin, is if you have so, uh, high risk factors, and this includes twins or, or triplets, or we don't tend to see higher order multiples than that. Um, it's not very common. Um, if you have chronic hypertension, if you have diabetes, um, if if you have um, any any kind of uh, rheumatologic disease that has uh, vascular issues, these are considered high risk. 
and it, and especially if you had a prior pregnancy that had preeclampsia. If you are at moderate risk, um, this would include, you know, not even having a baby before, um, having uh, your body mass index being 30 and greater, um, IVF pregnancies. If you have two or more of those for risk factors, then you would be, your doctor would recommend that you start baby aspirin. 12 weeks, uh, you know, as long as you start it between uh, before 16 has shown the best um, decrease in the development, but your doc can recommend it to be started up until 28 weeks. Before 12 weeks, um, you know, we don't, we don't actually, there, there are not enough studies out there uh, to show that because the fetus is developing, that the effects of low dose aspirin on the developing fetus. So really the reason for after the first trimester is that really the majority of your organs are formed for the baby. And um, what you're trying now is to prevent the development of preeclampsia. Wow. Thanks so much for explaining that, Serena. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have any follow-ups to that. That was really <laughs> Hey, thank you. Yeah, I was like, I, I was tuning in because, you know, I was on baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. So I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like, oh, it's like just hearing I mean, it. You know? And I mean, there's other things that it, it, it can help. And I mean, I think it's it's just goes along with if you're preventing one thing, you're going to prevent other things. So like it, it, it will say like decrease the incidence of preterm birth. Well, that makes sense. Right. Because. Right. If you decrease your incidence of preeclampsia or any gestational hypertension, you're going to decrease that chance of someone telling you, okay, you need to have a baby now because now you have this. So it decreases that incidence of preterm birth. Um, it decreases um, with that prematurity, you decrease a neonatal morbidity. So things that can happen after you're delivered. So all of these things are decreased, but it makes sense because you, if you decrease your development of preeclampsia, then you decrease your overall preterm birth, you decrease your overall neonatal morbidity. I mean, so to me, it's like it, it follows from that one. Yeah, absolutely. It all like stems from it. So that's, it's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, when is the earliest and latest you can measure your cervix and when is it too late to put a cerclage in the cervix and can you do a prophylactic cerclage would that even be beneficial so it's kind of if i need to break that down at all let me know so, right 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 so yeah typically so how your doc may uh, may do it in their brain um, meaning how they stratify um, is whether or not a you've had a prior preterm birth or not um, so there's there's one already fork in the road. Have you had a preterm birth less than 37 weeks and when? Um, or have you never had a preterm birth before? If you've never had a preterm birth before, then you would get a screening ultrasound to measure your cervical length at your anatomy scan, your detailed ultrasound. So between 18 to 22 weeks, generally speaking. Okay. So that would be the general path. Um, if you've never had a preterm birth, basically considered a low risk pregnancy for a early delivery. If you've had a prior preterm birth, depending on possibly when you've had that. So if you had either a loss in that second trimester, anywhere between 14 to 27 weeks, you could be offered uh, that screening ultrasound at 14 weeks. Um, I, and I, there's, there's again, algorithms out there. People follow different things. Um, there, there kind of is, like I said, when we first started, your provider might do something a little bit different. Um, but again, this is where shared decision-making and talking to your, your provider, um, you can come up with a plan that both of you are comfortable with. Um, say you had a preterm birth, but say it was like, 35 weeks, you might not have that first ultrasound until 16 weeks or 18 weeks to look at your cervix. And then depending on that cervical length uh, that that first ultrasound had, you know, shows, 
then the management comes from that. Um, less than 25 millimeters or 2.5 centimeters um, is considered to be starting to shorten. And it depends on what your doctors or your providers think or their experience is short. Some people use 15 millimeters, some people use 20 millimeters, some people use 25 millimeters. Um, just for people who are listening, normal for cervical length is anywhere between three centimeters to five centimeters. Your cervix can be longer than that and your cervix certainly can be shorter than that and you can still have a term delivery. So just because your cervix is now 2.5 centimeters doesn't mean you're doomed to have a baby, say at 30 weeks. Actually, the majority actually go to term. So it, it just, you know, and if you've had no prior preterm deliveries, actually a lot of this is, is going to be a watch and wait and, and see. Um, now, where you intervene with a cerclage, like the question asked, it depends yeah. again on the provider, but generally speaking, less than one centimeter. I think everybody, I think all my colleagues would agree less than one centimeter. It's an ultrasound indicated cerclage. Um, okay. They would put a cerclage in. Some people, some providers may use 15. I don't know of many that would use, I, I, I mean, and that's just me, um, that would use two centimeters. Now, if you've had losses, a loss at 20 weeks, they may put one in. I mean, I, I've seen that where your prior history was a loss at 18, 20 weeks, or even 16 weeks, and your cervix shortened, they saw, immediately saw the cervical shortening. It's two centimeters right now. At 16 weeks, they just go ahead and put it in. Now, okay. that being said, prophylactic cerclage, it's a great question because say you had a loss um, at 16 weeks, 18 weeks, and it was your typical story of someone with the diagnosis of cervical insufficiency where the cervix can't hold and they didn't feel any contractions, didn't feel any cramping. They came into the hospital and all of a sudden their cervix was dilated and they went ahead and delivered at that gestational age. Um, you would be, you could have a prophylactic cerclage and that would be put in around 12 weeks, 12. We typically do it then, um, 12 to 14 weeks. We can do it at any time, um, except we don't put it in after 24 weeks. So what okay. the second part of that question is when do you not put it in? We do not put it in after 24 weeks. Um, it has been shown that that is actually detrimental to, to do that, do so. Um, that is about the time we also stop doing cervical lengths too. Um, we don't, we usually don't look at cervical lengths past 24 weeks. Um, and I know that that's individualized because I know that people look at cervical lengths after, <laughs> after that, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> generally speaking, the general recommendations is not to do cervical lengths past 24 weeks. Um, and generally speaking, once you have your cerclage in, we also do not follow your cervical lengths as well. So, um, hmm. so that I think, I think I answered all the different parts of that question. You definitely did. And you know, it's interesting too, that you added in there after the 24 weeks, cause I didn't know that either. Um, that after a certain point, you know, and it does make sense with that Serena once you explained it. Yeah. 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 There is a definite stop point for, we do not put surclages in after that. Um, and for a woman, uh, unless you have an ultrasound indicated cerclage, meaning your cervical length is so short, we that we would offer that first. We generally offer for a woman who's never had a preterm birth, and she could have had a term delivery, but now in her second or third pregnancy is showing up with a short cervix. We would actually offer vaginal progesterone first. Okay. No, so as a general recommendation and, you know, obviously depending on your doctor, depending on your provider, they might feel more strongly to go a different direction, but yeah, yeah that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Okay. 
Next question is regarding no bed rest for high risk preterm delivery. Um, does having an occupation in a field where you're constantly up and down lifting things and being yeah. exposed, like let's say like medical or as a teacher or in the public service sector, um, being exposed to germs, illnesses, viruses, does that cause extra risk? Um, that's it's kind of a broad question, but for preterm delivery. Right. So I will have to say, you know, if this was my patient, I'd sit down and, and suss that out. Suss some of those right. to get more finer points. Cause that you're right. It's very broad. And, and for me to just say, well, I wouldn't know actually. Um, and I, and you know, me, I will say for me personally, what I would do is, is find out, you know, and this is what I think her, her doctor would as well, um, is that has she had a prior preterm birth? If she hasn't had a prior preterm birth, having a, um, a uh, occupation where you're going up and down, even up and down stairs, um, picking little children up, that shouldn't put you at any higher risk for a preterm delivery. Now, being, we know that healthcare workers, daycare workers, teachers, there are there are things that you can be exposed to that would be riskier for your pregnancy. Um, for example, parvovirus. You know, um, right. yeah. So we would all, um, I would have to say, you just need to mitigate those risk factors. You can a find out if you've been already exposed to parvovirus. Uh, by asking your doc to draw the labs to find out if you've been exposed. They can tell if you have immunity. Um, that, that can give you some information and give your doctors information as well. Um, they can also see if you've been exposed to even CMV, another virus that for, for, for most people it just shows up like a common cold, but its effects on a fetus, depending on when you get exposed, if it's the first exposure or a recurrent exposure, can have some pretty devastating effects if it's your initial exposure and depending on when you get exposed. And I think you and I, we've actually had a um, a podcast on, on that as we uh, did about infections and, and infections in pregnancy. And that is one. CMV as well as parvovirus is something that would be something that if you're in one of the like daycare and teachers, especially that, that would be something that you, you should be mindful of. And if you hear and chicken pox as well. And if you hear that one of your, your kids or somebody in the school has one of those viruses, you know, you need to talk to your doctor about how to mitigate that risk because then you certainly don't want to be exposed to that person or that child and, and maybe there's a way to remove yourself if you're, if that person is in your class. Yeah. But I think that, that, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I think that was the third um, episode that we did with you was all about the parvovirus with Brie. Um, right. Because right. it was something that happened to her. Yeah. 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 And I am daycare workers and teachers that, that is something that, yeah, to be particularly mindful of parvo CMV, um, which is cytomegalovirus, um, um, chicken pox is another one, that these are things that you can be exposed to that can have effects on the baby, depending on when you get exposed, depending on your own immunity status. And so those are things to be looking out for. In terms of preterm birth, um, typically those don't, they can lead to preterm birth, but not not talking about vaginal progesterone or that kind of thing. It, it, it leads to more preterm birth maybe because we might have to deliver you for baby reasons or, yeah. you know, it, for other reasons. Yeah. Well, and I think like you said, Serena, that's why it's so important one to be in tune with asking those questions. And immediately when you find out something or getting exposed to those things that you're reaching out to your doctor and letting them know, or to mitigate, even be proactive and say, this is my occupation. This is what I do. If this happens, what do I do? If this happens, what do I do? If this happens, because these are all logical scenarios, especially like you said, for like a teacher, daycare worker, things like that. And it's like, okay, well, what, what do we put in place here? Or, you know, because 
some, you know, survivors still have to, or not even, you know, survivors, but pregnant women, you know, pregnant people just still have to work. So right. it's like, okay, well, how can, you know, we do this where, you know, it doesn't disrupt your life, but yet we're also being safe for you and the baby. Correct. Right. Right. Now, yeah. I, I'll, I'll go back to the first half of that question where if I talked about if if you didn't have any risk factors. Right. If you have a risk factor, if you have a prophylactic cerclage, you should still be able to do your normal activities because we're putting it in the whole point of prophylactically is we're putting it in to basically close up that cervix. And I, and I describe a cerclage as basically like, you know, if you had a drawstring bag and then you cinched it tight, um, mm. closed the hole of the bag, closed up the bag, that's kind of like a cerclage. The cerclage, we, we place it in your cervix and then we cinch it down um, and, yeah. and close it up. So um, there, there shouldn't be any, uh, I mean, there shouldn't be any, um, um, uh, modification of activity, except for we probably, you know, if you have a prophylactic cerclage, there's, there's a reason for it. You probably wouldn't go running. Um, you know, yeah. <laughs> you probably wouldn't do things that you would, you wouldn't else normally do that, that would lead to something like if you if you had a prior delivery at 16 weeks and now you have this prophylactic cerclage, I'm sure you wouldn't think of, oh, I, I can now um, you know, right. run, my, I'm gonna run my couple miles a day or, you know, I think yeah. it, it's more of the, OK, I don't have to be on bed rest now. I can I can go shopping, go grocery. I can do my day to day stuff. I just you know, maybe have to write routine things. I probably can't maybe you have to modify your exercise routine. Yeah. Now, those who get an emergency cerclage, so say, um, you know, the, the question was more prophylactic. If you're getting a cerclage at 18 weeks, 20 weeks, because your cervix is now less than a centimeter, um, or your, uh, yeah, it, it would be considered more like an urgent or emergent cerclage, your doc is probably going to tell you to not do very much, but that doesn't mean bed rest. And I'm probably pretty sure that you're not going to be at a job where you're picking up children and running around with them. You're going to have to be, you can go to work maybe after you've proven that your cervix isn't doing anything and it's it, the cerclage is working, but maybe you have to have a desk job. Yeah. You know? So that's what that means by, you know, it's not bed rest, meaning you're confined to the bed and you can't do anything. It just means that you can't do what you were normally doing. But like you can a still feel. Yeah. 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 So and and the reason being is that they've done studies. OK, so it's not without I mean, it, it's it sounds counterintuitive. It sounds like you just want to lie there. It should help keep the baby in and that that will that's the best thing. But they've done studies on that and that hasn't been shown to be any better than the modified activity. So meaning okay. the outcomes are still the same or are similar. There was no no real appreciable difference between those who didn't who were on bed rest and right. those who did modified activity. So okay. bed rest and improve outcomes is what I'm trying to say. Okay. No, that's good to know. Cause I mean, you do, you think like, is it like me resting fully, you know, gonna, you know, take care of everything or what's that going to look like? But realistically one mentally, that's, you know, really hard to be on bed rest and, oh, yeah. um, oh my goodness. Yeah. And, um, so if you can do a modified light duty and follow, you know, the instructions to a T of what you and your doctor talk about and your plan and everything, you know, to keep you still lightly active, um, that you're not, you know, stuck in bed. Right. You know, I think right. that's great, Serena, to mention that. Yeah. So our last question that we have for this episode is, um, is there a such thing as too many ultrasounds that can affect a baby? And honestly, like when this question was asked, I was like, huh, you know, this was something that I had never even thought to ask, um, but I'm curious about it now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, and it's one that I do get asked. Um, it's not an infrequent question. Um, 
but it's the type of ultrasound. Um, and typically you don't get that type of ultrasound. So the type of ultrasound that can generate heat um, is not the ones that you typically get when you're doing a growth ultrasound or, you know, a very quick ultrasound. Um, those ones that, that generate more heat, um, cause ultrasound is, is, um, uh, sound waves. It's not radiation. And I, and that would be the first thing to say. It's not like getting an x-ray. It's not like getting a CT scan. It's not the same thing. Um, and the other thing to also point out, I, I guess, affect the baby. I'm guessing that that question is, is geared towards birth defects. Um, right. once the baby is formed, so 12 weeks, you're not about to create and go back in time and now create a cleft lip and palate or a limb defect, um, your, or a heart defect. Um, right. what is done is done in the first 12 weeks. Okay. Somebody might, good. yeah, yeah. And then somebody might ask, well, what about all those ultrasounds I get with IVF? Um, right. Yeah. And it, really it's the IVF process, the process of injecting the sperm that actually, that process, not so much the ultrasound has been shown demonstrate that there is a higher risk for birth defects in, in those babies conceived via IVF or, or the different techniques that are out there. And we, your doctor would explain that to you and you would be offered some additional ultrasounds as well as um, some genetic testing um, as well as um, an echocardiogram. And generally speaking, you would be referred to maternal fetal medicine to have those studies mm -hmm. done. Yeah, that's good to know. And I think mentioning that too, you know, the difference there between them, because I know when you look at Dr. Google, you know, you find everything and anything and it's like, is this referring to me? Is this referring to, you know, and you're not really sure what it's referring to um, if it's IVF or if it's, you know, things aren't that specific sometimes. So yeah, no, I appreciate you shedding the light on that Serena and saying, you know, 12 weeks fully formed, you know, everything is already determined at that point. That is, you know, a great, a great point to bring up, you know? Yeah. You can't, you can't go back in time to undo what has been done, but it's also what is hard to um, just even myself. Um, you also can't go back in time to put in something that wasn't formed. Right. So if your baby has say um, a hole in the heart, there's no way to fix that hole in the heart until you get to the, until the baby's out. Yeah. If it needs to be fixed. Um, if you have low fluid around the baby. Now there are some things that, that does, you know, and I, and, and this is why I say there speaking with your providers and, and really understanding the processes of what's going on. There are some things that are, are not absolute. They're, they don't fall in those nice, neat categories. So right. I say everything's fully formed by 12 weeks. Um, but there's some caveats, obviously. So yeah. for example, the lungs actually continue to grow and develop the entire pregnancy as well as the brain. Um, there are certain things that happen that can change the lung volumes or, or, or change what is going on with the brain. Um, and so when I say everything's fully formed, there are some things that don't fall in that, that, category. The heart is fully formed. You, what you have with the heart is what you have with the heart. If you have five, 10 fingers, 10 toes, that is what you have. 10 fingers, 10 toes. You're not going to have a missing finger at, unless the only way to have a missing finger when the baby's born is that we didn't catch it um, right. on ultrasound. Um, but something like the lungs, the, this is what I was trying to refer to with that if you have low fluid during a certain part of your pregnancy, that lung development doesn't fully happen. And then we talk about the fact that there's not enough lung tissue to help the baby breathe and, and right. do oxygenation once the baby's born. And so that is, again, a caveat to everything's formed. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, uh, Serena, for doing this episode, for talking through these questions. And if any survivors are out there listening and they have further, you know, questions that arise from this or had a specific, you know, situation and they wanted to write in and ask about, um, you know, from this, you know, that's why we're here. That's why Dr. Serena is willing to give her time to us, you know, to, to be there for all of us so we can feel that comfort and support with this um, and get those questions answered or at least open that dialogue up, like you said. Um, So thanks so much, Serena. Yeah, no, thank you again. And I think these are great questions. Um, They are questions that I get answered in my daily practice. So I hope people out there don't feel like these are stupid questions and there's no stupid question. Um, It's better to ask them as well. And And I just put forth too, if anybody's interested in coming on, and pretty yeah. you know, has a specific situation that they want to talk through, you know, we would invite you to, if you wanted, um, and we can blur your name. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. can do, that. You do we, it anonymously. Yeah. We can certainly um, have you, I mean, we could certainly do a, a talk with uh, and do that as well. I think. Um, right. You know, I it, I think it's hard sometimes when you get a question and I want to know more because I can't answer it in the way that maybe the person who wrote it wanted it to be answered. Right. Um, because I have to be general um, because there are more questions that I would ask. And so that might be one, um, something that someone's interested in. Absolutely. Well, and it just allows them like, you know, to crack the silence on this, because if they have those questions, more than likely, there's a lot of other listeners, you know, on our podcast who have that question too. like the too many ultrasounds, you said, you know, you get that question all the time. I was like, Oh, I never even thought to ask that. But now I was like, I should have, you know, in my head, I'm like, why didn't I ask that, you know, in our, um, in our previous pregnancies and stuff. So yeah, it was just, it's really good, because these are things that we all just, you know, need to come together on, talk through. um, And it's just, it's good knowledge. And so I can't, I can't thank you enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. And um, yeah. And next time I'm looking forward to, I guess, going only through four questions. It took a long time to get through. Yeah. To go through those topics. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I mean, those questions are great. And and it does. It sparks that conversation and it gets you to really think and, you know, bring up things that I wouldn't have thought about, you know, or, or things like that. So it's, it's good. So I've just, thanks so much, Serena. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and please follow and subscribe to our podcast to help us reach more survivors. And we are always with you, baby loss survivors until next time. Thanks again, Serena. Thank you.